a lot about the strategic plan uh, process that we're going to be working on this year, but keep in mind we uh, have our existing strategic plan and work on that has been ongoing. And uh, Dr. Weber is going to give us uh, an update on one of our uh, previous strategic plan goals. And some colleagues. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to review with you our progress and work regarding this important strategic plan goal. Uh, as you're aware, our strategic plan goal number three has to do with acquisition and allocation of resources. And specifically, objective number four speaks about our ability to recruit staff reflective of the diverse demographics of our students. It's really that piece of trying to have our school district mirror the demographics of our city. There are four action steps uh, for this objective. Number one speaks to our efforts to inform and recruit applicants, so those early stages of trying to go out and find them. Number two is regarding our intentional efforts to encourage students of diversity to consider a future in education, things like the TCA pathways that we have in place and our partnership with them. Uh, number three talks about the ongoing courageous conversations that the district is having regarding cultural proficiency and some of the work that Thomas's office's office does with our staff. And finally, number four speaks to uh, employees having opportunities to see themselves in other roles, kind of that concept of career ladders for uh, employees of diversity in the district. I wanted to start by briefly summarizing some of the emerging research uh, around recruitment and retention of diversity in education. Obviously a hot topic in any urban uh, school district in America. Um, we're all seeking the same outcome, which is to increase the diversity of our, of our staff and our teaching force. Uh, but unfortunately, the U.S. teaching force continues to not reflect the student body. And this deficit uh, continues to grow in part because of um, the increase in teachers that are able, you know, teachers in the pool um, not increasing fast enough, but also the demographics of students are changing. Um, the, there's an increase in minority students across the country and a decrease in white students. And so that deficit is continuing uh, to grow. And despite De two decades, really, of federal, state, local initiatives to try to encourage diversity and to, to lower that gap, um, we still are working on this and, and the gap continues to widen. So first, let's talk a little bit about teacher recruitment. Just a few bullets for you and, and things to consider. Um, what the research would suggest is that effective recruitment starts at an early age. Often middle school and high schoolers are starting to think about what they want to be. And we think that's an opportunity for us to get in front of them and say, hey, have you thought about education? Many of the Grow Your Own programs that are out there are now, they've had enough years underneath them that we're starting to see that those candidates are now starting to step into higher education. And hopefully that creates an increased pipeline, a supply pipeline for districts that want to um, hire those candidates into teaching roles. Um, second, successful recruiting of minority teachers requires that the district adopt aggressive recruitment strategies. And this means being on campus, building connections, building relationships with those candidates, oftentimes over many visits, because what we find in diversity recruiting is that that relationship is a key component on whether they come, and it's an even more important component on whether they stay. So we need to start to build that very, very early. Um, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, for example, um, accounted for nearly half of all the education and teaching certificates in the country in 2004. They continue to produce high numbers of teachers of diversity. So we believe that that is a pipeline that we need to more assertively pursue. We have recruited all over the country, but what we found is that when we go to Philadelphia, when we go to Detroit, when we go to Chicago, um, there's lots of people that will come up and talk to us, but they won't necessarily move to Nebraska. And so um, we, we continue to watch that, that front. Um, districts should form close partnerships with the local communities and community colleges and universities that are going to provide that pipeline close to Lincoln. Um, and, and creating that direct link between the candidates of diversity, their teachers, and us at the district is what research is suggesting as, as a best practice. Um, the district should also, or districts, should also uh, consider candidates from alternative certification avenues. Um, there is emerging research that suggests that um, some of the traditional uh, teacher certification measures, such as the Praxis 1, the Praxis 2, some of that testing uh, may actually create barriers for teachers of diversity to enter into the, to the workforce and, and keep out successful 
candidates that we could be looking at. And so um, any ways that we can look at alternative certification programs is also encouraged. And then um, making sure that we put our resources into the right efforts. Um, the research suggests that regional recruiting efforts are much more effective than those, out, than those long trips to Florida or to Detroit or Philadelphia, simply again because they may not come and if they do come they probably are not going to stay. Um, a great example of the partnership that we have, um, UNK has a program, uh, Peter Kiewit Scholarship Program, where they specifically recruit candidates that are dual language. So they're recruiting candidates to the College of Education that are students that are already coming from homes where English is not the native language. Um, it's typically a Latino, um, Hispanic population. We've gone out to UNK multiple times and we're on first name basis with a lot of those students because they've seen us three, four, five times. Trying to encourage them to come to Lincoln, come to our ESL programs, come to our special education programs, come and teach in Lincoln. So that's just a great example of, of that item. Then as we think about retention, um, teacher autonomy and collaboration with the administration is a key factor in retention of staff. And that shouldn't be surprised. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Trust and uh, influence in school-wide decision-making are factors that teachers cite as being uh, important to them on whether or not they stay. And um, that relationship with the administration and the, ex the expectations that are put forth, the supports that are in place, are key factors on whether teachers of diversity uh, decide to, to stay. Um, access to, professional, uh, to effective professional growth is also an important factor. Uh, spe specifically classroom management and the supports around classroom management, some of the initiatives like, that we have in place like PBIS, those are cited as being important to help support new teachers in general, but specifically in uh, being important for teachers of diversity who are more likely to go teach in urban uh, school buildings. Financial res uh, it, current research on financial incentives is mixed. Um, you know, um, changes in financial um, uh, merit pay, uh, salary structure changes, um, incentives to get people to come and stay. There's mixed research on whether that works. And, and really that doesn't surprise me all that much. Teachers that go into teaching don't go into teaching for the money. And specifically teachers of diversity that, that go into teaching are, are in there, are, they're, they're going into that for much more than the money. They're going into it for the, for the purpose of, 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 of changing lives. And so um, that research is certainly playing out that way. And then finally, um, the culture. The culture and climate of a building is absolutely critical to whether teachers see themselves as part of that community and whether they see themselves as wanting to stay in that community. Once again, it's that relationship. Do I see others like me? Do I get a chance to collaborate? Is my voice valued in this building? Do I have an opportunity to, to, to give to this building uh, what I have in terms of strengths? And so I, I wanted to start with the research really just as a foundation so you had a sense of, of how we plan out some of the work that we do um, in terms of recruiting, recruiting and retaining uh, staff of diversity. So now I have some of my awesome HR colleagues with me to talk a little bit about some of the work that we do. Um, and so I have Dr. Regan, who is my, um, is my secondary personnel um, supervisor, Dr. Kay Byers, who is my elementary supervisor, and then Kevin Webbles, who handles our recruiting, and he's my traveler. He, he is all over the place, um, multiple times to different colleges and universities. So I'll let them kind of start off with some of the uh, strategies that we that we put in place. Um, to begin, the early the early hires with the unassigned contracts is a great strategy we use that helps us hire over 400 teachers before the start of school year. So um, I, as you as Eric has mentioned that. Recruitment is ongoing, and we um, continue to align and attract and then um, select top talent for our schools. Just as early as yesterday, Kevin has been out to meet our future teachers that have just started their second week of student teaching um, and to get to connect with them so that we know um, who we will be seeing to apply and invite them to apply for our positions starting next year. Um, with the support of the Board of Education and with Dr. Weber and Dr. Standish with her budget project projections, HR's given them you know, the early go ahead earlier than before um, on staffing allocation so that we can project how many positions we have and offer the top talent um, unassigned contracts for next year. Every year we have a relationship with anywhere from 15 to 20 colleges every semester 
to place student teachers, practicum students, and observation students in LPS. And that is one of our great sources. Our greatest pipeline is having those students on campus with us, teaching in our classrooms, learning to teach in our classrooms. Every year we place an average of 3,000 college students in our classrooms to work with our teachers, learn about teaching every year. We have also talked with several districts about early recruitment of these student teachers, getting them with us, con converted to us, and making sure they want to be with us. And we started last year something that other districts have done too, called Student Teacher Boot Camp. We trained our principals early in December to work with students, to interview students, and to talk with them about the importance of being in Lincoln and why the advantages of being there. Then we held a student teacher boot camp, two sessions in which 125 of our student teachers only, we just did it with LPS student teachers, came and learned about how to apply, why teach in LPS, about professionalism, and also about interviewing skills. It helped them get prepared for those interviews that we held a week later with 34 of our principals who came here to the boardroom and interviewed for 45 minutes 124 students. Each principal took approximately four students, some a few less, and they interviewed them for 45 minutes, talked with them, really courted them, talked with them about the advantages of Lincoln Public Schools and teaching with us. That gave us the opportunity to do exactly what Dr. Regan was talking about, and that is get a read on early outstanding candidates and offer them unassigned contracts. So we had excellent candidates to start our year before we even started posting positions, and that was a great opportunity. We also, as a, just a last measure, we send out um, a reference or a, an evaluation to our cooperating teachers to just say quickly, Tell us about your student teacher. Is this someone you would want to teach with in your team? Someone that you believe would be a good addition to LPS? And we do that every semester with our student teachers. So we get as many early reads about that particular very large source of students possible. Number three up there, um, our future multicultural teachers workshop. We have an all day workshop where we invite students that are high school students in Lincoln Public Schools that are thinking about a career in education. Uh, this uh, Thomas's office helps coordinate, the, uh, coordinate this. And Dr. Joel's been there, my, my HR team is there, and essentially we just talk to them about what it means to be a professional educator in Lincoln Public Schools. We do some little workshop things with them, um, help to introduce them to the concept of being a teacher. Um, and they're, all, they're, they're always a great audience. They ask some great questions, but Dr. Joel says it and I say it. You know, if they stay on track, they stay on target, and they want to be in Lincoln, and they want to stay in Lincoln, if they can get, get to college and graduate, we're here to hire them. And they hear that loud and clear from the superintendent on down. So um, that is a, a great um, uh, activity that we do every year. And we'll have anywhere from 50 to 70. I think this last year we had about 55 that showed up for that. It's a, it's a fun day with the high schoolers. Nikki mentioned that yesterday I spent the afternoon down at UNL, and I was meeting with all the people who are student teaching in the Lincoln Public Schools and across the state from UNL. There was an audience of about 80, I'm a visual learner, I've always been a visual learner. Um, there were about 85 to 100 kids sitting there in front of me and visually there was one student of color within that group of 85 to 100 students. Another issue that universities have now is that fewer and fewer of their diverse students are choosing education as a route they are going. But just to give you a visual on that, just for first semester, um, sometimes there's more than that, but not often. In an effort to tap into those kids early, um, Eric mentioned that we hold a, a reception each fall. We invite students from universities around the state of Nebraska. So we get kids from UNO, Midland, Wayne, UNL, UNK, Wesleyan, Doan, uh, Union College, uh, and a few other colleges, but we invite them on, in for an evening. Thomas, Christy, and his crew really help us set it up. They do a great job. Um, uh, the Kiwit kids from UNK, uh, they've been starting to bring vans of kids, uh, which has really been fun to have them down for an evening. But it's an ability, and it's not just kids that are student teaching, it's students that are 
whenever that university allows them to enter the education program, we start tapping into them and we start meeting them. They come for two or three years in a row in the evenings, plus we talk with them when they go out, when we go out to those universities. Um, in the same vein, um, Eric mentioned our recruiting being mainly a regional recruiting kind of map, which would be the Dakotas and Colorado and Wyoming and Kansas and Missouri and Iowa and Minnesota and a little Michigan. And, but within that, when we do contact those universities, when we are on their campuses, one of the first things we do is try to identify kids that um, are, are students of color and immediately do follow up with them and I invite them to Lincoln and, um, and do conversations. Um, you'd be surprised uh, how surprised they are when they get an immediate contact back from somebody that's talked with them for five minutes at a recruiting fair. But it's those kind of contacts that make a difference with kids. Also, another way is through the local job fairs. It's um, another of our pipeline for the diversity recruitment. Um, people that relocate here, and so they are teachers, but they, they came late, so they are looking for a job in the near future. We can connect through them um, through the Journal Star, Star job fairs. Um, we also have a multicultural job fair at Lincoln High that we attend, and it's a way for us to talk to those juniors and seniors who are thinking of education and having those powerful conversations with them about, and, and also just exciting them about their passion and what they want to do and where they're going and for them to connect with us during their college years. In the last four years, we've had an opportunity to attract candidates from other countries, particularly the Philippines and Japan. Working with those students is, um, a lot of effort or those candidates because you have to work with Homeland Security, the Department of Labor, et cetera, to secure visas for them to work, H-1B visas. And then after their evaluations, we usually want to hire them on to continue with us. And we work with the permanent residence program. That takes much time, a lot of effort. They're working with attorneys and we're working with all the various governmental agencies to permit that. We've had such good luck. We've had nine of our teachers from the Philippines and from Japan and Ukraine that have come and taught and are teaching with us presently. So we're pleased with that effort also. I had mentioned the Career Academy um, and our, our K-12, both the students in our K-12 pathway, but also, also the students in our early education uh, pathway over there. Um, this chart represents our diversity within the K-12 pathway. And if you look at that, I look at that 29% and think, wow, that's, that's excellent. I mean, that's 29% of potential hires within, you know, four more years. And so we build, we, you know, we've built a great relationship with the Career Academy. We are their industry partner. So um, we see ourselves as being um, right alongside with them and helping encourage this pathway. And uh, we, we've been out to meet with them. We met with them at the beginning of the year. They had a little bit of transition in the middle of the year. Um, but our intent is to, to continue to uh, ride, ride alongside the career pathway um, pathways at the, at the Career Academy to hopefully create that grow your own concept when they are ready to graduate from college. Kay mentioned earlier that uh, one of the things we do each semester is uh, very early in the semester we get cooperating teachers um, feedback um, on their current student teachers. The feedback indicates information on quality, but it also indicates um, are there some students out there within our schools that are um, students of color that we haven't tapped into or that we don't know about, because that happens. And so we immediately try and find that out. Um, we encourage our principals constantly to be on the lookout and not only to identify students from universities that are in their building, that are students of color, but to really seek them out and, and recruit them in essence. Um, I, I agree with Kay. The best recruiting isn't what I do and it isn't what Kay does and it isn't what Nikki does. Uh, the best recruiting within our district is what our teachers are doing in the classroom. Very seldom do we get a student whose student teaches or does a practicum in the Lincoln Public Schools that doesn't end up wanting to, stu to teach in the Lincoln Public Schools. I mean, unless there's some familial reason they're leaving the city or something, um, 
they find out about the quality. They know that's the kind of environment they want to teach in. So we really spend a lot of time tapping into, into those students and finding out who they are. I had mentioned the uh, alternative certification plans or programs and number two up there, um, Kearney has a transition to teaching program and about a year ago, um, we had learned about some, some individuals in the community who were interested in wanting to become teachers, but they just didn't know how to go about doing that. And it, that many of them had a bachelor's degree, they had graduated from the university, they had graduated from Doan or Wesleyan, but it wasn't in education, but their, their calling was education. A couple of them were working in our CLCs, one worked at the Malone Center, one worked for the university. And Gary Zappala called me up because he knew who all these individuals were. He said, hey, would you come out and talk to them? Just come out and talk to them came out, they were so energized, I mean, such passion for wanting to be in teaching. And so we got them connected up with the Transition to Teaching program, which is an alternative certification program that is at UNK, which allows them to, um, it's kind of an expedited methods program so that they can get in the classroom faster if they already have that bachelor's degree. And so we've kind of created an informal cadre uh, with that group of, of people, it's about eight. We do work with UNK a great deal, with, especially with uh, students or candidates of color to recruit those candidates. We also work with other programs at various other colleges. We work with the Clifton's Honors Program here at UNL. We work with several of the fast track programs all over, and we found several this year through the alternative certification program at Dome, and especially in the area of SPED that we were able to work with. So we explore as many of those programs. Kevin keeps us in touch. I follow up because I do the placement of all the students. Nikki follows up because we talk all the time about it. So we do that too. We um, have found that uh, advertising is a key factor and we intend this coming year to have a greater presence in the H HBCUs. We have not traditionally been in the HBCUs in terms of recruiting. Kevin and I have talked a little bit about that and our intent that this next coming year is to have a greater presence in, in those colleges and universities. This November, um, we will have district leaders that will be going to the National Alliance of Black School Educators. And this is a great national networking um, for us in regards to our pipeline for teachers and also administrators of color for them to showcase our district and um, put us on the map in regards to um, diversity in our district. And then finally, local subs. We, uh, we will use local subs um, who have, they may have a degree that's not in education, but they may want to, they may have started a, a, a program in education, and they're up to that point where they're getting ready to student teach, or they've student taught, and they just haven't landed in a district yet. We will try to get out in front uh, and have early conversations with them, particularly if they're candidates of diversity, to help them through that certification process. Because certification in Nebraska can be fairly complex, and sometimes we just have to help them through that process. So how are we doing? Our current data, this is for certified uh, teachers. You'll see that in 15-16, um, our percent of employee, uh, certified employees was right around 5.05. The previous year it was four, it was, it was below five, it was in the fours. Um, this year we are at 5.35%. Um, we, we currently have a three year upward trend on certificated staff. Uh, we had 16 two years ago, 18 last year. Uh, we're up to 24 teachers this year. That's additional each year. So 16, we hired 16 two years ago. We hired 18 last year, 24 this year, including two administrators of diversity this year, which we we're excited about that. We continue to find recruitment as our biggest challenge. You know, that is that is the biggest challenge before us um, as there's just not a lot of candidates. So we have to make sure the ones that we see uh, that, are, that are the highest quality we get. Um, so as a result, you know, we're really leaning on those local partnerships uh, in our local universities. We're really going to be leaning on TCA to hopefully get those folks through. And we're going to continue to uh, look for opportunities to provide the best, the best way to, to land these candidates uh, in Lincoln Public Schools. And so with that, I will open it up for any uh, questions that you might have. Questions, Barb? Um, wow, great job, a lot of work, and um, you're starting to make progress, so congratulations, that's a good thing. Uh, I was just wondering, um, have you ever surveyed the multicultural students who uh, come to your uh, uh, workshop, conference, meeting, whatever it is, or the ones that are involved with uh, TCA education track? Um, to ask them a question, what is it that you need to become a teacher? 
Um, and also you were talking about the, that uh, fewer students of color at the university level are opting to become educators. And um, there are a number of different groups uh, for students of color on campus, as well as the Multicultural Center. And perhaps maybe you could take that kind of survey tool and ask a variety of questions with the theme of what is it that you need um, to become a teacher? Or, you know, because I, I think sometimes we do a lot of good work, but we forget to ask who it is we're trying to recruit. What is it that they need from us? Yes, thank you. We, 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 we have relationships with some of those um, student groups, but I, I don't believe that we've certainly surveyed. So thank you for that. Sure. Matt? Yeah, I had a couple of questions. So first of all, I see these data, when we've mostly been talking about teachers, obviously that's the biggest employee group we have, but you know, janitors, paraeducators, secretarial staff, those, those are all people that our kids look up to as well. Sure. How might this data be or not be different if we were to include all employees rather than just teachers? I have that because I thought you might ask that. <laughs> um, so the percentages remain fairly similar. Uh, many of our employee groupings do have a higher diversity um, number, um, particularly custodial actually has, I, I believe, our largest. But for example, um, when, you, when you look at our, our, all of our employees together, we have roughly 95%, uh, right around 95% that are white. So that mirrors similarly to the yeah. teachers. But it will it will fluctuate up and down. I can get you the 15, 16 numbers. It's actually we actually keep that every single year. It it, it doesn't change very much every year, but we do have class particularly classified employee groups that do have higher diversity of um, numbers. Custodial transportation are two. This sure. year. Going back to the slide about the career academy, do you there you had percentages on there? Do you know the number of kids that were in there? Yeah. Even if even if it's just close. Because it only had percentages on You know on what, I don't have the number, um, but I can certainly get that for you. Because okay. she pulled this chart right out of Synergy, so we can get that for you. Okay. That, I just, when I saw that, I thought, I wonder sure. what the number was. <laughs> you, as of August 10th, uh, we had 58 students that were in K-12 in early childhood, so that number's probably a little lower. Yeah, but, uh, okay. That's good. Great. You know, and the last thing that just might be something for us to keep considering is, you know, I think a lot of what leads to good teachers is kid people who had positive educational experience. You know, people who succeeded in school then want to turn around and become teachers. It might just be good for us to keep in mind, you know, as we're looking at any other data sets that might indicate whether or not we are making sure that, like, for example, I think our, you know, referral <laughs> to suspensions is higher for more diverse groups. You know, that might indicate that they may not be having as great of an educational experience. And so there might just be some things we want to think about maybe even earlier along making sure that all kids of diversity are having great educational experiences because I think that will lead them to then want to become a, a teacher as well. Annie? So what about men? What are we doing about trying to uh, recruit men to be teachers? I mean, are, broadening our concept of diversity in the teaching world. Just give you an example, when I'm out on the recruiting trail, um, you see few men that are training to be elementary teachers. Um, so in the same way I would uh, make a mental note or a, or a physical note on meeting a student that is male, that is wants to be an elementary teacher, um, and talking very quickly with Kay when we contact those folks to try and get um, you know, men into those kinds of positions. Um, we always go back to the issue of quality, and we're still looking for the best teacher. But uh, anytime we can take a good look at a quality teacher that's a male teacher for elementary, that's an example of something we really do recruit and look for. Just percentage, I can tell you, about 73% of our entire staff is female, 26 and change is a male. However, when you look at just the paras, 716 are female, 89 are male. So a large number of that is, is in that para-employee group. 
this year, for example, um, they hired 260 females in certified position and some 67 males. So you can kind of see the, the ratio there. Any other questions? Okay, Annie. Looked like you're still thinking. <laughs> I, I am. I was, have you, um, in the presentation, you didn't put anything about how what you're doing towards recruiting men. I mean, is there a bigger, it's kind of a philosophical question, issue here of like the way, the way the world of education is going, um, you know, that the number of people going into education is actually going down, mm -hmm. am I correct? Yes. Exactly. And the educational, the colleges of education are also looking at what's going on here and um, there's a bigger issue at play a little bit, are we not? Yeah, we are, we are very fortunate <laughs> to be in the situation that we're at right now. When you look nationally, uh, the number of students going into teacher education programs is dramatically down. Um, and, you know, we're, we're filling. I mean, we've, we've filled for this school year, but there are lots of districts our size that aren't even close to filling. So we feel very blessed to have the, the pool of candidates that we have. But I think you're right. It, it's the whole conceptually. And we also know that when the market's good, people are willing to take risks in other sectors. When the market's not good, education is a, a little bit of a safer environment to be in. So you see a little bit of that play too. Um, but yeah, I mean, across the country, um, two things are happening. Reduction in the number of students going into teacher education and then also reduction in programs. Universities are cutting you know, art or they're cutting PE or they're cutting industrial tech. And so then you don't have the programs to prepare those candidates. Okay. Uh, Eric, you and I over the years have talked about this uh, off and on, and uh, I, I know that this is something that's important to you. You've been working hard on trying to get our numbers up a little bit, uh, and uh, you know the innovation and uh, trying to do things, look at things a little bit differently. Uh, the early hires was one of the things that uh, particularly uh, jumped out at me, and I know there have been uh, a lot of examples like that. But the idea that if we just change uh, a little bit how we do this, and maybe we don't necessarily have a specific spot at a specific school yet, but we've got an outstanding candidate, we want to lock that person down, and right. we're doing that. We're going out and getting those people early. And I think that's been a huge benefit to the district. Uh, so I encourage you, keep uh, looking for opportunities like that, for ways to do things a little bit differently, think outside <coughs> the box, because I think that's been a real uh, good benefit for us. Uh, one of the things you'd mentioned is uh, minority teachers from uh, other places maybe not wanting to move to Nebraska or being reluctant. Do we ever ask why? <laughs> weather. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, I think weather is a factor. You know, for us to go south and recruit is really not a good use of our resources. It just isn't. Now, one of the places where we haven't, um, as I said before, one of the places where we intend to increase our presence is in those HBCUs because they go into those um, colleges and universities knowing that they're going to be highly recruited and they're probably going to be mobile. And so um, we're hoping that we can maybe shift that a little bit by going into the HBCUs. But yeah, weather is a factor. You know, people have a perception of Nebraska that it's not accurate. You know, we have running water, all those kinds of things. And so when you go talk to somebody in Philadelphia about coming to Nebraska, they're like, Nebraska? So we face that. Uh, last point, uh, I was uh, so encouraged when we were at the new teacher breakfast and Dr. Joel asked how many of the uh, people in the audience were uh, LPS graduates and how many uh, people stood up for that. Uh, and I think that that is such a great place for us to be looking, that whole grow your own concept. I hope that the Career Academy uh, ends up being a very fertile ground for us to, uh, uh, to uh, look for for new hires. Uh, and I think that that does speak to the fact that uh, kids are in schools, uh, they're inspired by an excellent teacher, and that ends up affecting a career choice. And then it it's, seems like such a victory, such a great thing for the district uh, when they go on, get their education, then come back uh, as teachers. So I think that that's, uh, that's really neat. Um, and that's all I got. Last word, Steve. Yeah, um, I had an opportunity to meet with HR leadership today and, and, um, and, and really just thank them for their tremendous work. We, we are fortunate, as Dr. Weber said, that young people want to come to Lincoln. In anywhere in Nebraska, they want to come to Lincoln. So we were able to attract top talent, but they do way more than just attracting top talent. It's about training, it's about retaining, it's about encouraging, it's about licensing. There's just so much that goes in the HR process that, you know, quite frankly, we I take for granted, but they do a tremendous job of that. And he asked a question about, um, you know, how do we keep that recruiting base up? We're in the eighth year of an economic recovery. And having been through a few of these cycles, 
When the economy turns down, there's going to be a lot more interest in teaching. And we're going to see people coming from the business sector that didn't have very stable jobs that are going to look for ways to get into alternative paths so that they can get into the teaching profession. It just happens every time there's a cycle. Well, we're not, we're not in a downturn yet. Nebraska is a little bit immune from what happens on the coast. But the truth is um, we're able to get the best of the best coming up. And then I'll just close with this. I didn't share this today. I sat next to Superintendent Houston this summer at a conference. And on the break, I didn't know who he was. On the break, he came up to me and he thanked me for the 100 Nebraska teachers that they have in their program. And I was stunned at that. I, I, I knew that Houston and Las Vegas and some places were coming up here to UNK and UNL and they were offering bonuses. But he said over the last three or four years, they've attracted 100 Nebraska young people to Houston. And their goal is to keep them. But they can't unless they meet a significant other down there and decide to plant their roots. And so a lot, I've, I've actually run into two or three of these young people that this year that you hired, and you know, I mean, you talked to them, that came back from Houston, good experience, great training, bonus man, money ran out, um, housing subsidy is only good for three years, they came back up to Nebraska and they came into Lincoln Public Schools. They have to compete against those big city districts that have a lot of resources to try to go out and, and recruit and capture top young talent, but fortunately, we're the kind of a state where unless you plant those roots, people want, and someplace else, people want to come back to Nebraska. And I have to think a lot of that has to do with how successful we are, because we, not everybody gets, obviously not everybody gets a job in Lincoln, but the ones who come here are very, very motivated. I also want to call out you, Dr. Weber, because you brought this to us. We used to hire late. And now we hire early, and we're getting the number one draft picks as quickly as we can. And that's, that, that is a, that's a major asset to what we're doing. Well, thank you. And to Don's point, we, we could not do that unless budget and finance was able to project the way that they project. And Liz and I talked about that. Dr. Stanch and I talked about that early on, that if we can project out what we think the budget's going to do, and we can say with certainty we've got X number of teachers that we know that we're going to fill. We just don't know where yet. And they've identified the rock stars. Let's go get them. We could not do that without budget finance, so. All right, thank you very much for the report, guys. Thank you. Next is the monthly financial report. Are there any questions for staff? Seeing none, that takes us on to announcements of upcoming events for the board. Uh, on Thursday, August 25th, we have the Career Academy Fall Partner Summit at 1045 at the Career Academy. September 7th, we have the uh, Chamber Coffee that morning at 8 o'clock at the Chamber office. That uh, lunch that day, we have Face the Chamber at the Country Club. September 12th, we have the Nebraska Children's and Family Changemakers Luncheon at 11.30 at the Embassy Suites in La Vista. Uh, the LPS Citizens Academy at 5 p.m. that night. I believe that's the beginning of a brand new class. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also that night on September 12th, we have the Mayor's Neighborhood Roundtable at 5.30 at the Mayor's office. And then that takes us to our next board meeting on September 13th. We are at the point again where we would uh, welcome public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board? Seeing none, there is no request for a closed session tonight. Uh, we do, however, have an ESU 18 meeting, so this board will stand in recess as we move into that meeting. I hereby call this meeting of the Board of Education of Educational Service Unit 18 to order. Laura, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer. Here. Mr. Boswell. Present. Mrs. Danick. Mrs. Danick is excused. Mrs. Duncan. Here. Mr. Mayhew. Present. Ms. Mumgard. Here. Mr. Schulte. Present. The Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted at the entrance to the room. Tonight we have one set of minutes from our last meeting for approval. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, they are approved as published. We have no items tonight for first reading. For second reading tonight, we have the Educational Service Unit 18 budget adoption. Mr. Mayhew. Move approval of the uh, budget as it is listed in the uh, agenda. Is there a second? Barb. I said. We have properly moved and seconded for approval of the ESU 18 budget. Are there any discussion or questions? 
Seeing none, Laura, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Ms. Beyer? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. We have now reached the time for public comment. Would anyone wish to address the board of ESU 18? Seeing none, I have no request for a closed session, and this meeting is adjourned.